In discussing the proper levels of generality of paradigms, Dobb mentioned Kuhn's thesis of paradigm shift in science and the recurring practice of incorporating rival paradigms as special theories within the, a larger and more general framework. This model is applicable here. Marginal utility is quite useful not only in describing the laws of behavior governing scarcity exceptions to the labor theory of value, but the law of behavior governing how much of a commodity is consumed at its labor value. Marginal utility theory, if incorporated into a labor theory of value, would be a major improvement in the sophistication with which the theory explained how and why the law of value operated through the subjective perceptions and decisions of concrete human beings. For example, Leif Johansson attempted in two articles to show how marginal utility could be incorporated into a labor theory of value in Marxism and mathematical economics. He described the general terms of such a synthesis. The Marxist labor theory of value has been the object of attacks, particularly from the point of view of marginal utility theory, or subjective theory of value, which has been a main component of non-Marxist mathematical economics. Marxists have usually rejected this whole theory and all concepts and mathematical arguments introduced in connection with it as if acceptance of it, or elements of it would necessarily imply a rejection of the labor theory of value. However, this is not so for goods which can be reproduced on any scale, i.e. such goods as have been the center of interest, Marxian value theory. It is very easy to demonstrate that a complete model still leaves prices determined by the labor of value even if one accepts the marginal utility theory of consumers' behavior. Elaborating on this statement in a later article, Johansson described a model in which prices were determined by con the conditions of production, which the marginal utility functions interact with the prices thus given only in determining the quantities to be produced and consumed of the different commodities. In any case, the labor theory of value as we develop it in the next chapter is not an inductive generalization from the empirical data of prices in the market. It is rather a law deduced from basic assumptions of the nature of human action, quite similar to those of Mises' praxeology. As Mises wrote, the variables of the market are so many that no laws can be induced from mere observation without the aid of valid steer starting assumptions established on an a priori basis. The laws of praxeology were a tool for analyzing market phenomena, not a generalization from them. Like Mises' laws of praxeology, our labor theory of value is not an inductive law of market price, but an a priori assumption in terms of which the observed phenomena of the market make better sense. Starting with an, our assumptions on the subjective mechanism of human behavior, we can understand why equilibrium price will approximate cost. And, given this baseline understanding of the primary law of equilibrium price, we can understand why price deviates from the cost principle in cases of scarcity. If an adequate theory of value requires a high degree of predictive value concerning concrete prices, then both the labor theory and subjective theory f fall apart equally. On the other hand, if value theory in the sense of an empirical rule from, for pre predicting concrete prices is impossible because the variables are too many, then both theories are likewise on equally untenable ground. But like Mises' subjective theory of value, our version of the labor theory is, set of, is a set of a a priori axioms and the deduction from them, which can be used to more usefully interpret market data after the fact. Bowen Barwick's critique of Ricardo or Marx, based on the fail 
failure of experience to bear them out in all cases are equally ap applicable to Mises' theory of value. Austrians have made a closely related argument that equilibrium price is an imaginary construct that can ne never be observed in the real marketplace, but as we shall see in a later section of the chapter, the radical epistemological skepticism does not bear much looking into given the, the Austrian concept of the final state. Any criticism of equilibrium price as a standpoint from which to examine actual market prices at any given time applies equally to the final state or final equilibrium price. As Mises himself wrote, the, sci the specific method of economics is the method of imaginary constructions. This method is the method of praxeology. An imaginary construct Construction is a conceptual image of a sequence of events logically evolved from the elements of action employed in its formation. It is a product of deduction ultimately derived from the fundamental category of action, the act of preferring and setting aside. The main formula for designing of imaginary construction is too abstract from the operation of the same conditions present in actual action. Then we are in a position to grasp the hypothetical consequences of the absence of these conditions and to conceive the effects of their existence. The imaginary construction of a pure or unhampered market economy assumes that there, that there is a di division of labor and private ownership control of the means of production and that consequently there is a market exchange of goods and services in services. It assumes that the operation of the market is not obstructed by institutional factors. The market is free. There is no interference of factors formed to the market with prices, wages, rates, and interest rates. Starting from the, these assumptions, economics tries to elucidate. The operation of a pure market economy only at a larger stage does it turn to the study of various problems raised by interference with the market on the part of government and other agencies employing coercion and compulsion. Boehm Barwick's hypothetical description of the a frictionless economy above can be taken as an early attempt as such an abstract conceptual model. Mises' final state was another, a model of the values towards which prices were tending at a any time. The prices of all commodities and services are at any instant moving toward a final state. However, the changing economy never reaches the imaginary final state. New data emerge again and again and divert the trend of prices from the previous goals of their movement toward a different final state. Rothbard developed the concept still further as final equilibrium. Despite his straw man caricatures and semantic quibblings with Marshall, it closely resembles Marshall's concept of the long run. It is to be distinguished from the market equilibrium price that are set each day by the actions of supply and demand. The final equilibrium state is one which the economy is always tending to approach. In actual life, however, the data are always changing and therefore, before arriving at a final equilibrium point, the economy must shift direction towards some final equilibrium position. Hence, the final equilibrium position is always changing and consequently, no one such, pos no one such position is ever reached in practice. But even though it is never reached in practice, it has a very importance in the first place. It is like the mechanical rabbit being chased by the dog. It is never reached in practice and is always, it is always changing, but it explains the direction in which the dog is moving. Ah, so Rothbard's objection to the Marshallian scissors was Marshall's claim that equilibrium price, or the long run, could be reached in practice. Strangely enough, though, I can't recall ever seeing any such claim by Marshall. We should be careful by the way to dis by the way to distinguish the Austrian concepts of the final state and final equilibrium 
from that of the evenly rotating economy. Marshall's long run, although bearing some resemblance to the final equilibrium, differed fundamentally from evenly rotating economy. The latter was an imaginary construct of a static economy from which all change was abstracted. The long run, on the other hand, was a goal toward the economy was tending at any given moment through the subjective valuation of market actors and the fluctuations of the market, much like Adam Smith's natural price.